Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Tyrone Pretorius, and I'm the vice principal uh, of the University of Pretoria. Uh, I'm, I'm going to acknowledge uh, some people, uh, and I'll have to make some presumptions that they are actually here. So I'd like to start by welcoming Mr. Leo Huss, the president of the convocation. Um, I know I saw the dean of the faculty of uh, engineering, built environment and information technology, Prof. Rolf Sonnenberg. He was around here. Good morning. Uh, the head of the Department of Civil Engineering, Professor Elsa B. Kersley, and Professor Hannes Grabe, director of the Transnet Chair in Railway Engineering. A number of my colleagues and other senior members of the university, welcome. And then obviously alumni of the university, uh, other special guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to all of you at this second alumni business breakfast. Uh, we have a series of four breakfasts planned for the year, and this one is the first for 2014. Sorry, the second. Thank you for making time to attend to uh, this event. Normally, we start first by feeding you and then having a formal uh, 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 event, but today we, we're trying to do it the other, other way around. Our speaker today is Mr. Brian Molefe. Mr. Molefe is the Group Chief Executive of Transnet, the state-owned uh, freight transport and logistics company. Mr. Molefe was appointed to this position in February 2011, following a successful stint as the Chief Executive of the Public Investment Corporation. At the PIC, he led an unmatched growth in assets under management from 308 billion to just under 1 trillion between 2002 and 2010. Mr. Molevi, Mr. Molefe is leading Transnet through its record-breaking infrastructure spend program. In April 2012, Transnet launched its groundbreaking 300 billion seven-year investment program, the market demand strategy. Mr. Molefe has a Master of Business Leadership and a Bachelor of Commerce degree from UNISA, as well as a postgraduate diploma in economics from the University of London. He has also completed the advanced management program at Harvard Business School the program for young global leaders at the Kennedy School of Government, as well as the executive program for a Wharton Business School. Before joining the PIC, he was Deputy Director General at the National Treasury, where he was responsible for asset liability management. Mr. Molefe is also a member of the South African National Defense Force Reserve Force and an honorary colonel in the South African Irish Regiment. He has received several awards in recognition of his contribution to the economy, particularly his role in the advancement of black economic empowerment. These awards include being chosen Chief Executive Officer of the Decade by the Association of Black Securities and Investment Professionals. And in October, Mr. Mulefe was named Africa's Business Leader of the Year by Africa Investor in Tokyo, Japan, while CNBC Africa honored him with a Business Success in Africa Award. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to invite Mr. Molefe to address us. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Pretorius, uh, Mr. Heise, Professor Sonnenberg, uh, Professor Kelsey, Professor Hrabi, other members of staff, alumni. 
I have taken the liberty this morning of inviting a special guest, um, Ms. Nobutle Dlamini, who, as you know, is a product of the university. She's finishing to study here. Uh, she was studying sports science. She was the number one uh, amateur golfer in South Africa. She was the number two amateur golfer in the world, and she turned professional in um, December last year. And next week she's leaving for, she's a member of the Ladies European Tour, and she's leaving for Europe uh, to play in uh, Slovakia, uh, Czech Republic, Rome, in Italy, uh, in England. Hopefully she'll play the British Open, uh, as well as in uh, Germany. Uh, it is not necessary for the university to tell us about the good deeds that they are doing. Uh, as they say, by their deeds you shall know them. So we already know what products the university is producing. Here comes the tree, the tree of the storm, the tree of the people. Its heroes rise up from the earth as leaves from the sap and the wind spangles the whispering multitude's foliage until the seeds fall. Until the seeds fall again from the bread to the earth. Here comes the tree, nourished by naked corpses, corpses scorched and wounded, corpses with impossible faces, impaled on spears, reduced to dust and the bonfire decapitated by X, quartered by horse, crucified in church. Here comes the tree, whose roots are alive. It fed on martyrdom's nitrate. Its roots consumed blood, and it extracted tears from the soil. The poet who wrote these words was Neftali Ricardo Reyes Bosualto, born on July 12, 1904, in Chile to a father who was a railway worker and a school teacher mother. We know him today as Pablo Neruda. Next month, we honor the 110th anniversary of his birth. In 1945, Neruda was elected a Communist Party senator for the northern provinces of Chile. It was a time of great upheaval in Chile, and indeed, almost of South America as the battle lines between the left and the right were drawn. A key moment in Neruda's life was the violent repression of a communist-led miners' strike in Lota, a city in Chile in 1947, where striking workers were headed into island military prisons and a concentration camp in the town. Neruda's moment culminated in a dramatic speech in the Chilean Senate on the January 6, 1948, which became known as Yo Acuso, I Accuse, in the course of which he read out the names of the miners and their families who were imprisoned at the concentration camp. Fearing for his life, he crossed the Andes Mountains on a horse, carrying with him the manuscript of his epic poem, Canto General. The stanza I have just read is from Canto General. Pablo Neruda evokes the idea of liberty for us through the eyes of a poet. He constantly reminds of the earth being nourished with the blood of our people, of that same blood being drawn into our trees, of corpses dangling from those very same trees. It was Thomas Jefferson of the American independence leaders who once wrote, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the, with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is the same tree that Neruda spoke of when he wrote, here comes the tree, the tree of the people. Its heroes rise up from the earth here comes the tree nourished by naked corpses. Colleagues, in this, the 20th year of our democracy, we have much to celebrate. 
we remain tantalizingly on the verge of achieving greatness. In 1994, we seized the opportunity to write a new volume in our history. We have made much progress in building a new democracy, in reshaping our economy and rebuilding our country, even though at times it may seem that we have not quite lived up to expectations of these early, heady days. As a nation, we have perhaps become cynical and jaded, but it is important to be mindful of where we come from, if only to ensure that we nourish the tree of the blood, that tree of the blood with our remembrances. In 1972, a year before he died, Pablo Neruda said something very poignant about South America, which could just as well have applied to our continent at that time, and indeed in subsequent years. He said, we are very fond of the word hope. We like to be called the continent of hope. Candidates for leadership call themselves candidates of hope. This hope is really something like a promise of heaven. An IOU whose payment is always being put off. It is put off until the next campaign, until the next year, until the next century. However, in recent times, our world has changed beyond recognition. We are in that next century, and our continent has progressed beyond what we have hoped for. The 2014 Ernestine Young Africa Attractiveness Survey, which came out a few weeks ago, paints a fascinating picture of our continent. The survey reveals a dramatic improvement in the continent's prospects and how companies are successfully growing in Africa. The three crucial broad shifts that have been highlighted are interesting, and they are the growth of investment into sub-Saharan Africa, the expansion of intra-African investment, the shift of investment from extractive to consumer-facing sectors, the prime factors behind the sub-Saharan African growth story are strong macroeconomic growth and outlook, improving business environment, rising consumer class, abundant natural resources, democratic dividend, and infrastructure development. African investors nearly tripled their share of FDI projects over the last decade. And in intra-Africa investment has also driven job creation on the continent. This growth is fueled by the need for improved regional collaboration and strengthening regional integration. With the diversification of economic activity in Africa gathering pace, growing employment levels are creating a new consumer class. This has paved the way for increasing FDI in consumer-focused services and manufacturing sectors, sectors other than extractive industries are growing in importance. The most striking observation from this year's survey is how Africa's perceived attractiveness, <laughs> attractiveness has improved. In less than five years, Africa has risen to become the second most attractive investment destination in the world, tied with Asia. South Africa, Nigeria, and Kenya are considered the most attractive investment destinations in sub-Saharan Africa. As a matter of fact, the 2014 AT Kenya Foreign Direct Investment Confidence Index, which came out last Tuesday, paints an even more optimistic picture of our country. South Africa has now jumped two places to become the 13th most attractive FDI destination globally. This is out of a survey of 300 of the world's top multinational corporations. This bodes well for South African companies. Indeed, our business leaders in South Africa are not waiting for surveys to tell them to go forth. They are out there doing business on the rest of the continent. Another dramatic shift in the survey shows the nature of our changing continent. Foreign direct investment in the technology, 
media and telecommunications uh, sector was the highest of all FDI in Africa at 20%. Metals and mining was at an all-time low of 2%. This is quite the change from the past when Africa was just a repository of extractive resources. The others in the top four were retail and consumer services, financial services, and business services. Now is the time for South Africa to meet the challenges that will enable our country to engage in healthy trade with our regional and BRICS partners. Although the challenges are many, the most urgent for us in South Africa are infrastructure, education, and skills upliftment job creation. It is possible for us to realize our full potential, but only if we overcome these challenges, and we shall. As some of us may be aware, in April 2012, Transnet launched our rolling capital expenditure program, the Market Demand Strategy. It is a 312 billion capital expenditure program over seven years. The market demand strategy is a revolutionary transition in the life of Transnet. It marks a definitive move to demonstrate the role that state-owned enterprises should play in the development of our economy. In helping to restructure our economy, the market demand strategy will also significantly change Transnet. The company is on its way to becoming one of the world's largest freight logistics groups and freight hubs. The market demand strategy is primarily intended to revamp and modernize Transnet's rail, port, and pipeline infrastructure, of which Transnet is a custodian. In the short term, our infrastructure development plan aims to promote industrialization in the economy by creating a market for locally manufactured components and jobs for local workers. In the long term, it will integrate our economy with those of our regional neighbors, creating inroads into larger markets and promoting regional trade and investment. On the 17th of March this year, Transnet made an announcement awarding one of the largest locomotive supply contracts in South Africa. It is a 50 billion rand contract for the building of 1,064 locomotives to four global original equipment manufacturers. This deal means that in just under 10 years, Transnet's locomotive fleet will be entirely new from the average age of 32 years at the moment. The locomotive transaction marks a significant milestone in the company's history and delivers substantial socio-economic benefits for South Africa. The drive to modernize our fleet is intended to improve reliability and availability of locomotives. This will improve customer satisfaction, ultimately leading to our crucial goal of road to rail migration of cargo in line with government's objectives. The award has stringent local content, skills development, and training commitments as dictated by the Supplier Development Program. This is an initiative whose, aim, whose main goal is to localize the production of imported machinery and equipment. In line with Transnet's commitment to boost South Africa's manufacturing capacity, all the locomotives, except 70, will be built at Transnet's engineering plants in Kurusport, Pretoria, and Bayhead in Devon, driving South Africa's regional integration objectives. In total, the localization elements in this deal alone are expected to contribute over 90 billion rand to South Africa's economy. Transnet Engineering's role in the agreement has been defined to ensure that it transforms into an original equipment manufacturer over time, positioning it to become a premier supplier of locomotives, wagons, and parts on this continent and beyond. This transaction is intended to transform the South African rail industry by growing existing small businesses and creating new ones 
we are going to create and preserve approximately 30,000 jobs through this transaction. Going hand in hand with this is our commitment to research and development. Transnet has budgeted 1 billion, 1 billion rand over the next seven years for research in rail, ports, and pipeline engineering. As some of you may be aware, we have formed a partnership with the University of Pretoria through our support for the Chair of Railway Engineering. The partnership revolves around three major aspects, graduate training, continuing education courses for industry, and railway research. As a result of Transnet's support of the University of Pretoria's Chair in Railway Engineering, a number of research projects are currently being undertaken to investigate specific aspects of railway engineering that require solutions of further development. We are looking forward to strengthening this relationship with the University of Pretoria. We are also partnering with the CSIR to develop creative solutions to our problems. We signed an historic partnership that will allow us to tap into the CSIR's technological innovation and research capabilities. In terms of the partnership, Transnet and the CIR will, CSIR will work together in identifying possible areas of cooperation and enter into specific arrangements in all areas of Transnet's operations. Last financial year alone, we spent 100 million on research and development. As part of our continued commitment to research and development, we established here in Pretoria the Transnet Engineering Innovation Center, which is a world-class research development and innovation center. It is run by driven, highly skilled, dynamic individuals whose job it is to dream big dreams, to come up with big ideas so that we may implement them. <coughs> the research and development team has already managed to recruit top performing students from all major universities in South Africa established key partnerships with top international research institutions and signed co-development and technology transfer deals with international manufacturers. This team has a challenging goal of recruiting over 400 world-class engineers over the next five years, providing an ideal opportunity for top-class engineers to become part of a dynamic team that is destined to leave a legacy for all of Africa. Education and skills upliftment are the two elements that play a crucial role in reducing inequality in this country. South Africa has had to grow from the very low base of Bantu education. Sadly, almost two decades after achieving freedom, we still have a long way to go before we can say that all our young people have access to effective schooling, a recognized tertiary education, and meaningful skills upliftment. The recent National Scare Skills List issued in May this year by the Ministry of Higher Education paints a dire picture of the skills shortage we face in South Africa. Amongst the top 10 shortages are electrical engineers, civil engineers, <coughs> mechanical engineers, physical and engineering science technicians, and industrial engineers. At Transnet, we value the importance of good education and the skills shortages I have just outlined are precisely the sort of skills we need. As a matter of fact, we offer bursaries for most of the skills mentioned. Education and training forms an important <clears throat> component of our market demand strategy. Over the next seven years, we will be spending 8 billion rand on training, including training 2,000 artisans at any given time over the next seven years. There will be 2,000 engineers, uh, tra uh, artisans in training. Five billion of the eight billion will be spent on university bursaries and grants and cooperation on research and development. As a state-owned company, we are more determined than ever to ensure that we have a skilled and educated workforce to propel our nation to even greater heights. It is important, therefore, that we work with institutions like the University of Pretoria to develop and nurture 
these skills. Neruda reminds us that heroes rise up from the earth as leaves from the sap. The sap, ladies and gentlemen, is what we in this room provide. We must provide the nourishment that Neruda spoke about so that the tree can grow. It is education, it is training, it is mentorship. Only then will we produce heroes who will stand tall. It will be a difficult uphill struggle, but with a great deal of courage, we can succeed. We must be courageous. Only then will we see Africa pulled out of poverty and drawn to glory. And this, I contend, is the historical responsibility of us, the generation in this room today. We cannot evade that responsibility by running away or shaking our duties. We will not sink into our easy chairs when there are ditches to be dug. We will not rush off to work on the problem of declining church revenues when there are trains to be built. <coughs> Let us remember the words of one of our greatest poets, a woman who was born in poverty, despair, and hopelessness, but who managed to prove all her detractors wrong by her courage and her drive to succeed, the great Maya Angelou, whom we sadly lost last week when she said, Courage is the most important of all the virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. Let us at least practice that one virtue consistently. Thank you. <laughs>